Right. Right. And this item is uh, here today. Uh, the recommendation is to hold it open. It's here for information, but it will give us opportunities to ask um, any questions mm -hmm. uh, regarding the uh, proposed uh, budget language. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Deborah Collins. I'm an attorney with the California Public Interest Law Project located in Oakland. We're a statewide support center for local legal services and statewide uh, state bar trust funded programs. And we specialize in affordable housing issues, including redevelopment. Um, so we've been following everything that's happened with redevelopment since AB 26 was enacted. And we've looked at, we've, we've done a thorough analysis of the May revise with regard to the redevelopment provisions and we'll submit written comments. Um, today I just wanted to point out three major points that we have concerns with, with the May revise. And the first one is with regard to the housing provisions, um, which is in section 34176 of the, of the amendment. Um, first off, we want to bring to the committee's attention that there are two pending bills in the legislature this year, SB 654 and AB 1585, that deal specifically with the housing provisions. Um, w one of the key factors that they have proposed is to transfer the low mod funds to the housing successors of the redevelopment agencies. We strongly support that provision because we know that California has had a long, long commitment to the development of affordable housing. These funds are critical to be able to complete the redevelopment activities that, that are and were occurring in the state at the time AB 26 was enacted. Um, and we think that these are very critical policy issues that are better left to deciding in a, um, in a different framework than within the budget process. Um, the second point that we'd like to make is that the um, May Revise still proposes to transfer housing assets and, and, and appropriately defines housing assets, that's a good revision, um, to the housing successor entities. But a major problem of it is that it transfers those assets and it eliminates any rights, responsibilities, obligations, or duties of those housing successors. That seems to be very unwise policy in the, in the immediate future and in the distant future. Um, these, are, th these are assets that were intended and targeted to be used for the development of affordable housing and simply transferring them without any rules or restrictions as to how those assets must be used to further um, affordable housing efforts in the state is just an unwise policy. Um, we would strongly recommend that the language that exists in AB 26 remain in AB 26 with regard to the rights, responsibilities, duties, and obligations. We recognize that the housing successors are concerned about not having finances to carry out those duties and obligations um, and the resources, that's one of the reasons why we're strongly suggesting that the low and moderate income housing funds be transferred also to the housing successors um, and that they be provided the resources to be able to carry out those obligations. Um, a third point is that in existing AB 26, and this is not changed by the May Revise, is that there's a provision that housing successors may choose to enforce or um, monitor existing affordable housing covenants. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent by redevelopment agencies, part of the very good work that redevelopment agencies did over the years, to produce affordable housing. And the quid pro quo for their contribution to the development of that housing was the imposition of long-term affordability covenants. If those covenants aren't enforced, aren't monitored, then we would have thousands and thousands of units at risk of converting, uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of residents of those units threatened with the very displacement that redevelopment may have caused them and then provided them with housing to offset the displacement results of, of redevelopment. So we b strongly believe that it, it, would, it would be comparable to a, a large public gift of, of, of public funds to not enforce those covenants. The final point is that in the, on, on the housing issue is that on the, they may revise the um, Department of the, the, the administration is proposing to add a level of oversight to the housing assets and, and funds that would include the oversight board, 
identifying and determining what are housing assets and would also involve Department of Finance being able to approve or, or reject the Oversight Board's decision. We would propose that this, if, if there is going to be an oversight of what the housing successors are doing with the assets, that that should rest with the appropriate state agency, the Department of Housing and Community Development, who has far more experience than the Department of Finance with regard to affordable housing issues and developments. The second major point that I wanted to make involves <coughs> accountability of the local and state ag agencies and transparency in the dissolution process. Um, we have, we appreciate the fact that oversight boards that were only very recently created um, are subject to the Brown Act. Many of them are putting notices up on their agendas, uh, of their agendas and, and what actions they're going to be taking on 72 hour notice. But these involve very complicated issues. And we believe that there should be transparency to the public because what the oversight boards are doing does affect the public who ultimately it was their tax money that that generated all of the debt and generated the all of the benefits. Um, so there should be a very transparent process, uh, both from the oversight boards, the Department of Finance, the county auditors, um, and the state controller's office. For example, if the state controller and the Department of Finance are going to veto a decision made by an oversight board, which was really <laughs> intended to be made locally, intended to be made by the community, if that's going to be vetoed uh, by the Department of Finance, there should first of all be standards for the Department of Finance to have to follow as to why they're vetoing. Because the law should regulate what what is an enforceable obligation and what isn't and what is a, um, uh, what an asset is and what the value of that asset is. Um, so the Department of Finance should have to have standards. They also should have to have an obligation, along with the, the controller's office, to post on their website decisions and determinations that they're making. Um, the current May Revise language would provide that basically the public would find out in the next six-month recognized obligation payment schedule whether or not Department of Finance had approved or disapproved an action taken by the Oversight Board. That's just not acceptable for the public. Um, a third um, major point is that there should be more notice to the public, m a meaningful opportunity to submit comments with regard to actions taken by any of these entities, local or state, um, an obligation for those entities to consider the comments made by the public. I think the May Revise provides for the Oversight Board only to consider the comments of the county auditors, um, controllers, even though it provides that the public may make comments. Um, but a meaningful process would engage the entire community. Uh, finally, there's a provision in the May Revise with regard to expanding the authority for successor agencies to refund and issue bonds. And we fully understand um, the necessity of many successor agencies to refund or finance or, or refinance their bonds um, and to the extent that that's going to assist them in paying off their debt sooner, assist them in getting better terms on repayment of the bond, reduced interest rates and such, um, that's, that's a good thing because it would mean that there would be more money available to pay off the, all of the debts um, and, and more money available for other taxing entities. However, we have some concerns about it and one of the concerns is um, is that it calls for, it, it's such a major issue of the bill to refund bonds. <laughs> the major debt of redevelopment agencies is in bonds. Um, if they go out and refund bonds and, and uh, should extend that debt beyond what it is now, that could create a, a, a problem that was intended to be fixed by AB 26, which was to reduce the debt of redevelopment agencies. Um, and many redevelopment agencies will do this wisely. We, we, we know that they will, but we also know from our 20 years of experience in terms of litigating redevelopment cases that the law isn't always followed. And if it's reviewed only in a validation action and subjected to a 30-day statute of limitations, um, with 400 redevelopment agencies and millions and millions of dollars of bonds at stake, decisions could be made about refunding and refinancing bonds and then rubber stamped by a court because these are very complex issues um, without 
anyone really having the time or ability to carefully review that bond issuance. We don't oppose the refunding and the refinancing. We're just concerned about the process and, again, the transparency. We have, we'll submit written comments. Thank All you right. very much. Um, thank you. And I would hope, I, I, I was going to start actually with the Department of Finance and the LAO and then go to the response. So I'm going to go ahead now and go give the Department of Finance and the LAO the opportunity to make your presentations and then we'll hear from um, the other panelists. So thank you. Chris Hill with the Department of Finance. Um, the, the, the measure that we proposed did, um, it creates a mechanism to effectuate the transfer of affected to the affected taxing entities of the unencumbered cash assets to the former redevelopment agencies. And this is to be done in accordance with Assembly Bill 26. This is the requirement of AB 26. And we are just creating a mechanism or a framework to make that work more effectively. And um, we did not have any budget savings scored with this at the governor's budget because of the fact that we, um, number one, there wasn't a really a mechanism to effectuate the transfers, and number two, we didn't have a good idea as to what sort of the volume of money we were talking about. But now that we have some data from the state controller's office for the 2010-11 fiscal year, we've been able to identify a pool of approximately $4.8 billion in unencumbered assets, which includes low and moderate income housing assets and various other funds. And we have extrapolated from that that approximately $1.4 billion in Proposition 98 general fund savings can be achieved in the 2012-13 fiscal year by transferring these monies in accordance with AB 26. And we are proposing this as a budget solution. And there have been an additional $600 million to flow to schools in the 2013-14 fiscal year. Um, and as the previous speaker alluded to, the bill also makes various technical changes to Assembly Bill 26 to make it more operative, to make it work more effectively. Um, we do clarify what does and does not constitute a housing asset to cover those properties that were purchased in whole or in part with low and moderate income housing funds. We uh, create a mechanism for successor agency oversight boards to effectuate the transfer of those mixed-use properties to the housing successor agencies. And we also clarify that rents and other payments associated with low and moderate income housing properties can be used to um, to maintain the properties and to also maintain affordability covenants, which we understand was a very, there was concern that the previous bill did not provide that, that authority. And we also make various technical operative changes to the bill, such as clarifying um, due dates for recognized obligation payment schedules and various other things, just to make the bill work more effectively. Um, and in terms of the uh, refunding of the bonds, I'd like to address that in particular. We do have a mechanism in the bill that would allow refunding. We believe this is declaratory of existing law. And we also would note that there is a review period for finance that can be extended for up to 60 days to review these proposals to ensure that they will not result in the successor agency incurring an additional amount of debt. This is just, again, just to ensure that the bonds can be could be refunded in such a way that you're reducing the total total volume of debt that has to be funded. So in other words, you're not increasing the, the debt of the former redevelopment agency. And I'd also like to address um, the comments that were made concerning finance's ability to determine what or what is and is not an enforceable obligation. And there's concern about the fact that there might not be standards for finance to use when determining what is and is not an enforceable obligation. And I would just point out that we do have standards, and those standards are in Assembly Bill X-126. And we are applying those standards. We are applying the requirements of the bill whenever we, view, we review a recognized obligation payment schedule. So we're not making things up arbitrarily. We are doing the best we can to interpret the requirements of the bill and to apply those requirements. And some of the changes that we're proposing in our trailer bill language actually make that work more effectively. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Marianne O'Malley with the Legislative Analyst Office. The May revision ref uh, assumes that the, re the dissolution of redevelopment will provide a $3.2 billion budget solution in the current and, and budget year. Um, the administration has recently released this trailer legislation that makes a, a variety of, of sensitive and, and significant changes to ABX 26. And your staff recommendation is to hold the matter open um, pending further review, and, and we think that that's, that's meritorious. Thank you. So now we'll go to the, the, um, the other uh, 
panel members. Um, uh, I think we have Mayor David Glass from Petaluma. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, honorable members of the committee. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I understand the difficulties that the state of California is in. I just retired as a municipal securities uh, principal. However, what we're looking for in the city of Petaluma is one of fairness, one of clarity with the rules, because we've tried to play by the rules. And I'm going to tell you our particular story uh, of this. I noticed that the staff report says this is corrections and cleanup. Up. In our case, it wouldn't clean it up. It would clean us out. It says this is clarifications of the law. We certainly would welcome that because we believe in fairness. We've played by all of the rules as we knew them to be. And it talks about remedies for bad actions. What this really is is a remedy that will deny us the ability to implement a long-term vision. So how specifically has the law to date affected us? Uh, I will tell you where we are in the city of Petaluma, and you may know our community, you may not. We're 32 miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge by all stretch of the definition, one of the more affluent communities probably in the state of California. And yet with this crisis that we've all managed our way through, we've seen our general fund budget go from $48 million to $32.5 million today. We've seen our city payroll reduced from 350 employees to 266. We've seen our general fund reserves decline from $8 million to $376,000 with a projection in two years of having $130,000 in totality of our reserves on a $32.5 uh, uh, $32 million operating budget for our general fund. So we're in dire straits. And what concerns me when I look at this in the trailer legislation is the clawback features that might put a, either an interruption or a halt to our sales tax and to our property tax. We can't afford not getting what's due us, and we can't afford any interruption or time delay in those cash flows. Uh, one of the projects talked about uh, this clears up unencumbered assets. We certainly would like to see that cleared up because we have one uh, project that was a $28 million project. East Washington and Highway 101, our most important intersection in town, that is a $28 million project, $4 million of redevelopment funds, and that project is listed by the Department of Finance as one that did not qualify. It's under construction. I don't know that we have the money to stop that construction. I don't know that with uh, the definition from the Department of Finance that we have the money to finish the construction. I do know that we need an a determination here uh, on that. We have another project that was approved in 2003 by the City Council. These are long-term projects that require a great deal of time to get them shovel ready to put people to work and provide the infrastructure that's been promised. The old Redwood Highway Freeway Interchange at Highway 101 is a $41.5 million project that we have $15 million of what we thought was our money in the bank and it's ready to go out to bid. It's ready to go under construction. Significant development has taken place relying on these safety improvements and on the traffic flow and we're now caught in a limbo land and we're looking at trailer bill legislation that would, if we proceeded forward, cause us to what, deliver money on a clawback that we don't have? So what I'm looking at with the trailer bill as a mayor of this town, and this is my second term, I'm looking at bankruptcy as being maybe the only viable alternative for this community. And if it affects Petaluma, which has had an investment grade rating on its redevelopment debt and has weathered this storm to date to that degree of ramification that the only choice for us would be file bankruptcy, I can't begin to guess, and probably neither can you, how many communities are similarly impacted by the unintended consequences of this legislation. I would ask you to please consider the speaker's remedy that he has provided in uh, legislative form for you. I would ask that we look and find some other avenue. There's got to be a better way. That's all I'm here pleading for is there's got to be a better way than to say that projects that are under construction or ready to go out to bid somehow do not meet the definition of an unencumbered asset. Thank you very much for your time and I appreciate being here. Uh, thank you, um, Dan, Kira. Thank you. Uh, 
Madam Chair and members, uh, Dan Kerrig on behalf of the League of California Cities, just to echo a couple of things that the mayor said. Um, first of all, you had a process in, in AB 26 that, that, that was structured in a way that actually allowed for community input. It set up these oversight boards that had the schools on it, had the counties on it, had the special districts on it, had city representation, had some labor representation. A and the idea behind these boards is that they would perform the balance that, that I think you would expect to happen in a, in a tool like this that's being dissolved. Look at the projects. What are the things that that are worth uh, continuing and completing versus do I score another dollar today? Those decisions were made all around the state, such as as in the mayor's situation. Uh, that oversight board had a public hearing, went through this process, looked at the project, decided that it was better to actually fix a highway that was that was already under construction than just try to pull a couple of dollars out of it. A and so, so, so those are the things we're talking about. Um, I in the testimony, Mr. Hill uh, described this, this bill as technical and clarifying. It's much more than that. Under this measure, the, the role of the oversight boards, this, this, this community input, it, it, they're basically pushed to the side. Uh, it, what, it, the entity that's empowered is, is the Department of Finance, very significantly, um, to the detriment of, of any uh, community that may have a dispute with them. Um, the prior witness also talked about the lack of transparency. I, I would argue there, this, this trailer bill is replete with the lack of transparency or due process. It's one thing to get to, to send your thing to Sacramento and get it denied, but there ought to be a clear reason for the denial and it ought to be backed up by the law. A and we would argue there are many provisions uh, in 26, I think probably some of the reason the Department of Finance is, has a thir uh, what is, is about a 30 some page bill clarifying the law is they know there's lots of problems in the law. They know there's lots of gray areas a and to the extent they can tighten up this law to their benefit, I, I understand exactly why they're trying to do that. Um, I think the policy question for this body is th there were, w w we all know where we are in terms of redevelopment being eliminated. I think the question is where do we go from here and how do we go from here? Now many legislators in this building have said, you know, we really didn't want to eliminate redevelopment. Okay, I, we, we have that and th there's an area of agreement, but we know it's, it's been eliminated. How do we transition away from it? The speaker's bill uh, we would argue is the much more prudent path. It tries to balance between um, preserving those things, the housing assets, or, or, or recognizing legitimate loans that were made uh, 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 you know, I under prior law uh, with uh, necessary technical corrections. Tries to provide a balanced way to, to, uh, to, to end this tool. Um, this bill I would suggest is much more crash and burn. It's simply take everything you can possibly get. Don't really worry about what the actual impacts are on the ground. And, and, and I, would, I would stipulate that this is something that the legislature ought to take uh, seriously about how, how to transition this tool. Because we're all talking about other policies we want in this building. We're talking about SB 375, transit-oriented development. There's other, other uh, groups of legislators in this building working on talking about new tools. What's the relationship going to be uh, between local government and the state if, if this sort of measure goes through? And this is, the, this is the dynamic we have to deal with for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, I, I, I would urge the members to read this bill carefully. It is not a technical bill. It is not simply clarifications. Uh, <laughs> there are some uh, positive provisions in there, but uh, we are very concerned about the thrust of this bill and, and its effort to undermine uh, local authority and, and flexibility and also eliminate our ability to, to defend what we think are legitimate decisions such as the mayor's. Thank you. Um, and our last uh, Panelist is Philip Kilbridge with Hello. Habitat for Humanity. Greetings, Thank Madam you. Chair, Assembly Thank Members. You. My name is Philip Kilbridge. I'm the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, Greater San Francisco. I'll be speaking specifically about affordable housing and more importantly, the residents that we serve across the state of California. We represent working families, emancipated youth, homeless veterans, and many more of our citizens who we believe deserve a, day, a decent, safe place to call home and shelter. In response to Governor Brown's May revision, I have to shake my head and ask yet again, 
I mean, first of all, redevelopment agencies eliminated, bond funds drying up, and now even the dregs of funding for projects that have been in pre-development for years is now being pulled away. I'm reminded, a friend told me about uh, the, the children's story the Grinch who stole Christmas, right? And so um, the Grinch comes down the the chimney, you know, first of all grabs the roast beast, you know, grabs the the um, Christmas tree, grabs the, the presents, um, and then that little ornament sort of goes, you know, running away down the chimney and he grabs that and takes off and that's how it feels. That's how it feels for not just affordable housing, but really the residents that we serve. I mean, here we are with an opportunity to build real homes during this economic crisis, to put real people to work, um, to address not just the housing, but the jobs um, crisis in California um, through incredible leveraging of the low and mod funds that are on deposit. Um, and these aren't the enforceable obligations, but these are other projects that could be built and developed um, with the low and mod funds on deposit. Um, in fact, I'd like to share a few things about uh, with numbers. 12,000 homes. Um, we've been polling developers across the state, cities, and counties, and we've come up with 12,000 homes that realistically we could break ground on in the next three to 24 months. These are projects that we have worked on um, ad nauseum over the last years and years and years, and this is that redevelopment funding that is that first necessary funding to make these projects happen. Um, and, and it's not just the home, but it's the residents of those homes. I mean, we're talking about lost opportunities translating to families and children's that, children that sleep in overcrowded shelters, double up with family members, sleep in cars, and isn't, um, isn't it necessary to have a good night's sleep in order to succeed academically? I mean, isn't a safe, decent place to call home um, foundational and necessary to success in our schools? But beyond homes and beyond the residents that we serve, we're really talking about jobs as well. This is the number one issue of the day, is, is creating jobs. 27,000 jobs in the next two years could be created in the construction industry to build these residences. Um, and it's not just putting people to work, it's not just putting food on the table, but it's then the tax benefits that accrue to the state of California through putting people to work. Moreover, I think that it's, there's a leveraging that we have to talk about here, at least three to one. Every dollar that is put in by former redevelopment agencies into low and moderate income housing does go, get leveraged at least three to one by other additional sources. And that's something that's taken out of our California economy at a time when we can ill afford to do so. I want to share one example of a development that's at risk. It's not um, Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco's. It's actually stand up on second. They're a Los Angeles-based developer. Um, and this will really reflect the human impact of the decision. Um, they have in their pipeline a development called Michael's Village. Michael's Village will transform a rundown hotel into an attractive and well-designed apartment community. More importantly, the 24 residents of Michael's Village will be drawn from Hollywood's service registry of those most likely to die without housing. Let me repeat that. The residents of Michael's Village will be taken from the registry of those most likely to die without housing. And so when I, when I get passionate about this and when I talk about it being a life and death issue, I really, I really mean that. And this is just one of the hundreds of developments that are at risk that have been moved along um, in California that, uh, that would be shut down um, with this decision. We're aware that leaders in both houses are potentially crafting a proposal to preserve the housing funds and make the state budget whole. We fully support this, su this approach and we urge the subcommittee to adopt it at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. I know that there are going to be many questions, but I just would like to start out by asking panel members, and Ms. Collins, you probably did the best job of all. Um, this isn't a policy committee hearing on AB 1585. In fact, all of you know it passed with bipartisan support off the assembly floor. This this committee is dealing strictly with the budget, so you know we're not we're not going back and rehashing the fact that. AB 26 passed, whether or not we're not discussing the option of should we go here, or should we pass AB 1585, that's a different policy discussion. So my question is, focusing strictly on the proposed um, budget bill, 
that we have before the Department of Finance. Can you go over any very specifics that you think are good about the bill and should remain in, or specifics that you think create um, problems and um, uh, you know need to be uh, addressed? Are you asking? You could, I'm asking all of you because, I, like I said, the the vote. The, the, and we're going to hold this open, but our vote isn't whether or not we should approve 1585. Our vote, our ultimately, our task is to to approve budget language that hopefully works, and that's what I would like you to address: is the specific uh, budget bill language. In, in the chance that I wasn't clear, and if this doesn't fit, then just stop me. Okay. But uh, my concern is the trailer bill. And that, I think, is part of the Governor's May revise. And my concern is the way the trailer bill is written. And my particular concerns about that, uh, and I haven't read the entire bill, but I've read a summary. Uh, so there may be more that I would be concerned as I learned more. But the immediacy of the clawback provisions for well-intentioned communities is forcing the communities onto a tightrope that they can't walk. Right. And so some clarity and clarification of that, right. elimination of that type of a provision, whatever it is. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but that East Washington, those projects that I talked about, they were denied. Every single project we had on our list, $34 million. We went 0 for 34 million. Right, and you're con but you you have two concerns there. One concern that that um, there is that they can claw back from sales tax and other rev revenue, sending your budget in a tailspin. And the other concern in terms of the process for uh, approving that project and being able to appeal. Where do we go? And, and we need to go in a timely manner. I mean, we're out there. Construction work is taking place. And, and Who do, how do we pay for it? Can I, and can I ask, when was that project, the East Washington project, Highway 12 project, bid? It was um, approved by the City Council in December of 2005. Uh, these are long time projects, and so it went under construction maybe as much as a year ago. Our neighboring community of Sonoma, the city manager told me that they had a com project that was now completed, and that project somehow didn't meet the test of being under contract. So it, so could, so you, you bid it in 2005, when did you sign the agreement? We did not bid it. These are very complex right. to get out okay. to bid. But we authorized it, and so then you go through a series of steps of working with Caltrans, working with Regional Transportation right. so Authority. You authorized it then, when did you actually then put the project out to bid? You know, I, I, I don't know that, but it's been under construction for a while, so I'm thinking last year. Okay. Sometime last year, maybe it went out to bid. The old Redwood Highway project that I talk about has been years in design, review, and all of that, and it's now ready to go to bid. So are we to take the millions of dollars that we've invested, uh, and we've got Highway 101 finally getting widened, and we're ready now because 101's getting widened to make these regional transportation improvements, and we won't be able to participate with money that we issued and saved. We didn't build a sports stadium. We didn't build a swimming pool. We saved our money for infrastructure, flood control projects, and the like, and we're sitting there having played by all of the rules as we know, knew them, then played by all of the rules as we knew them even under the successor agency, and so it's too many rules changing too rapidly in too many different ways, and we don't have enough money in our so budget for attorneys to tell us what the rules are at this stage. So are you, saying there needs to be clarity in terms of when projects and costs were encumbered then? I think there needs to be fairness. Okay. I mean, I'm asking more for, give us a fair bite at the apple. Where do we turn, where do we go, how do we proceed? Uh, certainly projects that are under construction must meet the definition of encumbered. Other than that, I'm kind of like throwing you and myself at the mercy of the court. Um, I'm not, you know, a full-time employee of the city. Um, so it's a more of a volunteer structure in, in our form. Uh, I can get any good. answers that you want and get all of the answers that you want to any questions you have. Uh, uh, Assembly Member Allen knows my email address. He'll share it with all of you. <laughs> I'll get the answers. You have the questions. Give, give, give us the questions and I'll get you the answers. I may not be able to give them to you right here. Okay, are there any of the other panelists in terms of, like I said, Dan, we're not talking about whether 1585 is the preferred solution. What I want to know on this, because that's a different discussion, is what specifics are the 
do you like or not like about the trailer bill language and, and why? Well, in, in terms of like, we, we agree the refinancing provision. Uh, we we understand some attorneys are looking at that, at that, but we know that is that is something that we've supported in the past. We, we think that that can be helpful. Um, we, we understand that obviously the housing advocates have some concern with the structure of some of the housing asset, asset language, but we understand there's an effort to clarify some things there that can be worked through. Uh, I, I really think when you, when you look at what I think our most substantive frustration is with this measure is th there, there are a variety of, of provisions in this measure which, uh, w which have the effect in totality of limiting the ability of someone like the mayor here to have any due process in this. There are, there's, you have over 400 agencies out there. You, you, you've, you've sort of stopped the clock at midnight in, 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 with the development going on across the state, and there's a process of, of unwinding. You had a bill uh, that went through that I'm, I'm sure the drafters did the best they can, but, uh, but, but th th we all know there's a lot of areas of, of uh, confusion about that law. Uh, and we also know there's a lot of, given the variety of development projects, uh, whether something is, uh, is, is the bulldozer uh, moving or is it still in the planning stage. Um, what, what, what I think cities have been getting more is of is more reject re just simply rejections of of these proposals when they feel that there hasn't been adequate due process a and the other thing I, I I know it's like well, we're not we're talking about a budget process we're not talking about uh, policy but but th this bill does uh, change significantly even some of the policies in 26 and they have to be pointed out. Um, the structure, again, under 26, was that you, you, you set up an oversight board that had community input to try to balance out the mayor's issue. Should the project go forward or not, let those affected taxing entities, those that, that if the project doesn't go forward, are going to be able to put money in their pocket, right? So, so they obviously have an interest, a financial interest as well, balance the community uh, impacts versus the fiscal uh, 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 benefit of, of stopping the project. Why isn't it that if those community boards have made the, the decision, the judgment that you exercise as, as elected officials, that council members exercise, boards of supervisors exercise, why isn't it, isn't it that that judgment should be given no weight? Uh, this bill pushes those, those sort of decisions aside and, and substitutes it for someone in Sacramento who may never have been to the community, may know nothing about this project, and may know nothing about the consequences of not proceeding it, but is simply looking to score something for the general fund. I, I'm not going to comment on whether yeah. it's right or wrong. The AB 26 did provide for the level of DOF approval. And so wh what I have been hearing is there needs to be more clarity with respect to that and reasonableness. What would be helpful is if you could provide us, since we're holding you know, this open, if you could provide us with your own um, specific list of, of um, you know, what you believe is, like I said, the, the, what you believe works and is reasonable and what you believe um, is not reasonable and, and needs to be revised in the proposed trailer bill language. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. The one other thing I just want to emphasize again is the concern about the lack of due process. If, if finance is going to be denying things, they need to be denying them based right. upon, uh, the, the, cite, it, cite the laws and the interpretation based upon what you're denying it, not sort of D denials with no uh, recourse for those affected to uh, to uh, ha have some sort of due process. I, I would echo what Dan just said with regard to 34179.5 and 34179.6. Um, those generally are good provisions because they add a lot of clarity that's needed to AB 26. But the devil is in the details and the details are not adequate. Uh, they're not adequate with regard to setting standards under which the Department of Finance would veto a decision by a local oversight board, which is representative of more than just the city or county that took over as a successor agency. The, the, if the oversight board and the successor agencies have to follow standards, the, the, the Department of Finance also has to follow standards um, for, for vetoing that decision. Um, there are... Um, other provision, other sections of those two, those two new 
new sections proposed by the administration that could definitely be strengthened with regard to transparency, which I had mentioned earlier, and we, we will submit written comments on that. Um, the, let's see, I'm flipping through my list. Well, I got the transparency okay. notice of the right. public. Um, I, you know, I the, the bond, the bond issue. Great bond okay. Issue, yeah, I don't know if there's. I would say beyond echoing Dan and Deb's comments, I would say that through Housing California, we have and will provide additional language and clarification for Thank you. the assembly members. Well, I have more questions, but before I m monopolize all this, are there members have any questions that they would ask clarification? Some member. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, and, and uh, I appreciate all of you and your and your comments. This is something obviously we could talk about it at some length, uh, more time than we have this afternoon. But I, I wanted to probe a couple of the of things, um, particularly with uh, with the Department of Finance. So, just to try to get a a little bit of um, a snapshot on on where we are. Um, we've got the first property tax allocation to successor agencies coming up based on, on June 1st as the, as the date um, for payment of, of recognized obligations over, over the next um, six months. Can you characterize for us at, at this point how, uh, how much has been um, submitted or requested, how much you expect to approve and how much you expect to be disallowed? It's still very much a moving target. We currently think we're still on track to make the $818 million in the current year target for K-14 schools in terms of the additional property tax they'd receive via after the payment of the enforceable obligations. So 18, uh, 818 for the schools and, sure. how, mu and w uh, how much to local governments? Mm, we don't have the split on that just yet. Okay. We, we haven't parsed all the numbers, but based on the um, the rate at which enforceable obligations are being approved and denied, we do still think we're going to hit the budgeted or the, the May revisions revised $818 million figure for Prop 98 savings in the okay. current year. So that you got w one part of the equation. Uh, and um, can you give us any idea of the rate of, of approval and, the, or, and disapproval? I'm afraid I don't have that information with me. It's all in spreadsheet form. It's a it's a document that's being updated every day by our auditors, and we have 400 successor agencies, and so it's it's a continually moving target. So I'm afraid I don't have any set numbers right now as to overall approval and denial rates. We we are working on compiling something like that, but as to when it's going to be finished, I'm afraid I can't give any definitive. The, the, Im the impression is very widespread that virtually everything's been the request is being disallowed. Impressionistically, can you can you comment on the accuracy of? I, I can of tell you that that is not true. We are. Basically, what happens is, and I'm not trying to be criti critical here, but you only hear about the things that are denied. You don't hear about the ones that are approved because the ones that are denied are, of course, ones that I think are the bone of people's craw. Been approved. So we, our, our auditors are approving many, many items for payment from property tax monies, but they are questioning certain items, and typically they're questioning an item because there might not be an underlying contract with a valid a valid binding third-party contract that was executed before June 28th of 2011. That's a very common reason why we're denying obligations. And if there is a signed contract that was executed before June 28th and is with an outside third-party vendor, that would, be, that would be recognizable as an enforceable obligation. So what's dynamic today presumably will not be dynamic June 1st, right? Um, By then you will know the answer to the, these kinds of questions. The it, in terms of the overall amounts, yes, by June 1st or very soon thereafter we should know. And as a matter of fact, I believe there's legislation that requires um, the uh, county auditor controllers to, to report to the uh, um, community colleges and the um, Department of Education the amount of money provided to schools and community colleges for the current fiscal year. by by June 1st or very close there too. So I, I, I would request to the chair of the committee that we get a as, soon as, as soon as possible after June 1st we get an answer to the kinds of questions that, that, I, that I'm posing, not just what is going to the schools right. for, to, to satisfy uh, or for Prop 98 um, purposes. 40% well, of 800,000 is two, $2 billion or, you know, so, or 800 right. million is $2 billion. So. 
I just want to follow up on your question and allow the other members. Um, I had one other after you follow okay. up, if I may. Um, you're assuming we're going to be able to transfer this, but de when um, cities have their projects denied, my understanding is they can resubmit them and appeal. So how is that going to work with the amount you're expecting to transfer? You know, your response to some of Dickens's question. Since no, 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 I want the department, you can come in. Okay. I want the Department of Finance to so answer that first. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand well, the question. Well, my understanding is if, you know, my projects go through mm -hmm. the successor agency, the oversight board, go up to the Department of Finance, and you say we're rejecting them all, that I have the ability to resubmit with additional information. Oh, they, certainly. Be um, approved. So you're, so you, you told Senator Dickinson that you expect Eight hundred million to be transferred to schools, but mm -hmm. how much of that is potentially in limbo because these cities are, or counties, these redevelopment agencies are going to actually um, provide more information and appeal your decision? Is that our our intention um, is to have everything shut down on June first, and monies would have to flow out by then. So we're working very closely with successor agencies on issues that are being appealed to try and resolve those as quickly as possible because on June 1st the way that the administration sees is when the money has to flow out so there would be no money in limbo um, that our preference would be that there be no money in limbo our preference is that auditor controllers are to pay out based on the decisions of the Department I of Finance as of June 1st as so week from Friday you're gonna have all of that resolved we're working, um, we have 60 auditors, over 60 auditors working on these, and so we, we, we believe we will. Well, I'll let Senator Dickinson ask his next question. <laughs> uh, the the um, criticism has, has been made that essentially what the trailer bill language does is anoint finance as the judge, jury, and executioner, uh, that really the work of the successor agencies and the oversight boards is valueless because Finance is going to get to make every every single call virtually with, without appeal. Mm -hmm. It does seem as if the uh, trailer bill language sets up a, 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 a number of questions uh, that are problematic uh, from my point of view. Um, for example, it makes it very difficult to get judicial review. Uh, it, it makes one wonder what's going on inside the black box. Where, where is any sort of administrative um, a, a appeal to uh, anyone who has uh, a modicum of neutrality in, in reviewing uh, decisions that, that are made by the Department of Finance? I, I want to give you a chance to, to respond to, to those and the similar criticisms that have, have been made. Thank you. Um, the oversight boards if there were, when they look at an when they look at a recognized obligation payment schedule and the enforceable obligations thereon, we believe the oversight board should be applying the requirements of Assembly Bill 26 and determining whether or not those are enforceable obligations. And the successor agency comes with a proposed recognized obligation payment schedule, and the oversight board should be looking at them and saying, okay, well, according to Assembly Bill 26, this is and this is not an enforceable obligation. And then that document is amended by the oversight board, comes to the Department of Finance. And we view our role as just being, according to the legislation, according to AB 26, we view our role as being to check those oversight board approved recognized obligation payment schedules to ensure that the oversight boards properly applied in AB 26, the requirements therein. And we, we check, and if our auditors find that perhaps there was something on the bo oversight board approved ROPS that was not an enforceable obligation, then we view it as our obligation and duty under the law to, to remove those. But we do, of course, leave open the option for the, over for the successor agency to appeal those decisions to us, and we're happy to receive all the supplemental information they have that might prove that something is an enforceable obligation. And there have been cases where they have provided supplemental information, and we've changed our minds. But again, we are the over we have the oversight board process, and then we have finance, and we, we think that provides two very fair levels of review for the recognized obligation payment schedules. Well, I, I won't pursue this for at the moment. I would say you're describing this as if it's a ministerial undertaking. 
uh, and uh, it seems to me it's it's much more than that, given that there's still a great deal of definition that's evolving, uh, and and under debate about what constitutes enforceable obligations, uh, and all the all the related matters that go with it. What what becomes of of housing obligations, for example, as as was mentioned. How do we ensure that the covenants of affordability are are maintained over over time? How do we ensure that uh, loans that have been legitimately made by municipalities to their redevelopment agencies, uh, pr in some cases years and years ago, uh, have an opportunity to, to, to be repaid. And this, this language does not seem to lend itself to a very transparent uh, level of uh, or style of, of review and a, and a style of review that is very difficult to ob obtain any outside review of. So uh, it seems to me we have got a number of issues to to parse with the uh, trailer bill language, uh, and I hope that finance will think about some of the issues that have been raised here today in terms of trying to come to a solution that, that works better from at least my point of view. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Carey, do you have a comment that you would like to make? Something, something specific for you. Um, on, uh, in, uh, in the language of the trailer bill on page 16, this is to, to Mr. Dickinson's point as well as the Chair's uh, question, uh, it says, in no event, however, shall a successor agency or an oversight board exercise the powers granted by the subdivision to restore funding for an enforceable obligation that was deleted or reduced by the Department of Finance pursuant to subdivision H of 34179. You go look at subdivision H. Subdivision H is the key provision that Finance has to review the decisions of an oversight board. So that's kind of where we feel like we're in a bit of a box canyon. Once Finance denies, yes, you have an oversight board, yes, you have a successor agency, but they're pretty much cut off in terms of their ability to, to defend their own decision and, and to uh, have Finance, I think, justify the reasons for its decision. <laughs> Assemblymember Dickinson asked about experientially what has been the experience with the ROPs. And, and I don't have official numbers, but we have been looking at a fair number of these recognized obligation payment schedules um, throughout the State, the ones that have been approved by Department of Finance. And in terms of dollar amount, in terms of dollar amount that a local um, successor agency is proposing to be on the ROPs versus the amount that has been um, approved by Department of Finance, we typically find from these reviews that they are being reduced by about 20 percent, sometimes maybe 25 percent, very seldom much more than that, at least the ones that we have been reviewing. Now, as Mr. Hill pointed out, there's many, many um, recognized obligation payment schedules that are still under review, particularly some for some very large cities. But in terms of wholesale um, rejection of an entire ROPS, that's not what we're seeing with our review of it. Secondly, you asked about how much money we're likely to see. Um, the county auditors throughout the state on May 1st submitted information to the Department of Finance regarding the amount of funds that they think will be distributed to schools and to other local agencies. Now, these estimates are just that because we still don't have final decisions on the ROPS. Um, but using those sort of estimates as to how much ROPS may well be reduced and looking at these numbers, we're coming up with an estimate that's much lower than the administration. We think in June 1st you may be seeing only about $200 million going to schools. And our out year estimate um, for the budget year is also lower than the administration. Um, and then very lastly, in terms of the Department of Finance's rejection and in terms of the ROPs that I have been reviewing, um, typically the, the reasons why an item is being reduced is because it is not, it, it is a cooperation agreement with the city is a very common reason. Or another reason is that there is not a valid contract. Or the third reason is that there is a contract, but it is not necessarily with the redevelopment agency. It may well have been a contract with the city, and that would not be ineligible to be placed on, on a recognized obligation payment schedule for the redevelopment agency. It is an obligation, but an obligation of the city and not, not the former RDA. So those are common reasons why the Department of Finance cites um, that a, a particular item ought to be removed from the, from the, from the ROPs. Um, certainly the Department of Finance doesn't have wide discretion if it oversteps its boundaries. Um, you are going to have some court action saying that there is a contractual obligation that should be, should be honored. And very lastly, there is litigation 
regarding some of the items that are that are being challenged um, on the ROPS. Um, and and the, the court is and the litigants are asking for the court to basically sequester the funds that are being challenged and make sure that they're not being distributed to other local agencies while these decisions are are, are being reviewed. I apologize. I was trying to take notes. You said the typical reasons for rejections. I think the first one I got the not a valid contract or the contract's not with the RDA. What was the first one? Um, also cooperation agreements, okay. basically loans back and forth between the city and the redevelopment right. agency. I, I can remember one that was a billion dollars in a city in, in Los Angeles County. Um, that was approved by the Oversight Board. However, ABX 26 is very clear that cooperation agreements right. um, are not valid to be placed on the ROPS. So that was a case where it was approved by the Oversight Board, went up to the Department of Finance, the Department of Finance struck it. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other other members who have questions? Uh, some member Allen. Not not so much a question as just a comment that um, I find it hard to evaluate when when I'm being told that there's been lots of approvals and denials. I, I I would like to know exactly what we're dealing with because we're hearing it's going to be all kind of wrapped up or some sort of um, report by June first. And to me, the most important thing that I've been hearing from the panel discussion, and this is just my own take on it, is that you have procedural due process and you have substantive due process. And so it just seems to me that when we talk about fairness, I, I think what we want to do is with whatever trailer bill language we do come up eventually, we don't end up in a morass of lawsuits because basically you have the, we have the law we passed last year and now we're talking about um, putting on another layer for this year's trailer language. So it just seems to me that the more that there can be um, a perception and, um, and a reality of fairness where there is some place to appeal this in a way that all sides feel they're going to get a fair shake is the kind of language we want to end up with. I realize this is incredibly complex, but if we make it even more complex, then uh, essentially we're going to be end up spending millions and millions upon dollars in litigation to find out what was the first layer that we did and then the, the rewrite. So that, that's that's my concern, and and I do believe that when we establish the oversight boards, we felt strongly that the community stakeholders would would uh, basically proceed on, on the basis of good faith. So um, I, I know we're not going to arrive at a decision today, but but just speaking from um, a very basic point of view, uh, I would make a plea for that for the folks who. Um, uh, uh, who are looking at this language that is in, in the um, in the um, trailer language bill to, to to point out to exactly where the, maybe this is my my direction to the League of Cities and the folks that have come on the reaction panel to know clearly where they feel there's inequities unfairness and um, how it could be written in such a way is that we don't end up in generations of litigation over the unwinding of redevelopment. Thank you. Are there any comments from committee members? Sub member Atkins, I know you have some questions. Thank you. I think uh, people have done a real good job of asking most of the questions, which is really good. Uh, Chairwoman, I want to thank you for letting me join you today, uh, although I'm not a member of the committee. Um, I, you know, overall, um, and I'm not uh, referring to the bill, but I do want to say to Department of Finance, we appreciate. Uh, given that we've had ongoing dialogues with Department of Finance, at least staff members have, about inclusion of certain issues that are outlined in AB 1585 uh, have been put in here. The things that you deem to be clarification that, that is needed, we appreciate that. Um, so while this is not a policy discussion, I, I do think some of those things were very technical in nature and necessary um, for the timely and more um, well, implementation of the dissolution. I do think to go a step further on on the um, transparency and the balance of power, um, you've already heard comments about um, a process uh, that is a review only of Department of Finance and that's it. But even further, the validation actions brought by successors or parties to enforceable obligations may not be brought unless uh, consented by both Department of Finance and the controller. And so you're even limiting uh, the jurisdiction's abilities to make a case for um, 
uh, enforceable obligations that may be truly enforceable obligations. So I would put that concern out there. Um, I do think um, we are unwinding something that is extremely complicated. We knew that uh, it would be very difficult to do this, and, and I think that uh, 26X sought to give uh, some control to local agencies, and clearly we have work to do in terms of the oversight boards and the decision-making process, but we can't, because of what we're seeing coming forward from some of the um, successor agencies and the oversight boards and the approval of ROPs that are questionable by Department of Finance, we cannot go so far in the other direction that we take away every opportunity for dialogue. And I think all the relevant questions have been asked. Thank you for keeping this open. Um, but I think we've got to make this a little more balanced um, going forward um, because some of those projects and, you know, really uh, are complex. And, and just to tell you, I have been living with multiple cities and ROPs and looking at examples and having to call Department of Finance to say clarify this for me because when I read 26X, which I've read multiple times now, and then I look at the explanation by Department of Finance to a particular project and I see that it seems to indicate, it seems to me, uh, I'm not an attorney, but neither I think are many of the people, people in Department of Finance, but when it seems to me that some of these are enforceable obligations on the face of it. So to put them through the extra steps of multiple um, more information you need, uh, it, it makes me wonder, you know, uh, how you're going to work your way through all of these because some of them seem, even in my estimate, to be enforceable obligations. Date not even close. So. I think that that is what a number of the members of the legislature are dealing with every single day with our cities and our successor agencies. We are having to be the ones to try to look and see what we think because they're calling us. And so we need to make sure that process is going to be one that people feel comfortable about. Uh, and right now, I appreciate hearing from the LEO. I'm not sure that it feels uh, that way. And maybe we do need to see the things that are being approved because uh, uh, I think it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel that the intent of AB 26X is being followed when I read the letters, when I look at the ROPS list, and when I read 26X. So I think we need a little more help there. And I do agree with you and with Mr. Dickinson that after June 1st, which I think is a very optimistic date for some of these complex uh, projects, it would be good to see uh, the spreadsheets and, and get a little bit of an uh, oversight of, of how this is working, you know, in right. the next few weeks. Thank you. I, I have, well, I have a number of questions. There's just one more I'll ask and I'm going to take public comment. But, you know, we talked about one of the reasons for some of the rejections are cooperation agreements. Are you distinguishing at all between cooperation agreements that were made last year versus cooperation agreements that were made a decade ago or 15 years ago. I mean, cities, when they made some of it, wrote some of these agreements a long time ago, had never dreamed that redevelopment agencies would be eliminated. Now, you know, I don't want to get into whether there were things were properly used, not used, or whatever, but the city's whole financing. Um, schemes for its own city and managing its budgets and everything else were dependent on these. There are some small cities, for example, that would take years to build up enough affordable housing funds because they're working on very small tax increments to take on a project, and yet they might have an opportunity that would come up, and so they would then loan the RDA money to go ahead and build these houses. Mm -hmm. And now they're 15 years into it, or 20 years, and and you know what my understanding is for many of these we're saying we're not honoring them. I I there are situations like that that just seem to me to be patently unfair versus the situation where someone intentionally went out and created an agreement to um, to uh, circumvent the intent of AB. 26. So are there any discussions like that going on um, within the Department of Finance to see if there is some way 
that in, in your second look or the appeal process where you can actually try and determine where people did act in good faith um, with these agreements? Because if not, if they have these agreements, you're really, I mean, you're, I think we're leaving cities on the hook. And I, 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 I don't think we intended that. When, in terms of cooperative agreements, if, if it's an agreement between the city and the former redevelopment agency, and that's it, then our auditors are probably going to have an issue with that. Now, if the cooperative agreement has an underlying contract with a third party vendor requiring that certain work be performed, and that contract was executed before June 28th of 2011, that could very well be an enforceable obligation. And I don't know the details of any of particular cases, but as a general rule, I think what's happening is these cooperative agreements, in many cases, there's not an underlying binding valid contract with a third party. It, it might, so that being the case, Assembly Bill 26, we believe, is pretty clear that agreements between the city and the former redevelopment agency, unless they meet very specific criteria, do not qualify as an enforceable obligation. So on the strength of that, a cooperative agreement just between the city and the RDA, unless there is some sort of underlying third-party contract, is probably going to be challenged by our auditors. So if the city, for example, is managing a housing project, it, there would be no third party, and that wouldn't be enforceable, but if they had a contract with a third party, it would be. Is that the type of situation you're, even though the something had been in place for a if, decade? If there's a requirement in the contract that the redevelopment agency provide funding for this, then that that could meet the criteria of enforceable obligation. But again, we'd have to look on a case-by-case -case basis. We have 400 successor agencies and um, <laughs> numerous, numerous types of, types of um, singular cases. So I, I just want to say, I don't want to debate the Petaluma example uh, in public because, but, but, but where you have a project where uh, an RDA is, or city is par a small part of a bigger project that was started years ago, um, you're, are you taking strictly, are you looking strictly at the contact track, Dave? How are you taking a look at that? Again, it's going to depend on whether or not there's a, an obligation, a contractual obligation for the redevelopment agency to provide funding to a third party for, for work to be done. And if our auditors don't see that, they're going to, they're likely going to challenge that. Yeah, okay, I, we, we won't get into that more. Let me, let me ask at this point in time, is there any public comment? Okay, we're, we're going to speak at the mic here, and um, if you could uh, keep your comments very brief, that would be great. Um, I'm also, as you heard with the panelists, very open to receiving any kind of written input you can give us, because to the extent you can do that and point to specific uh, parts of the uh, proposed trailer bill language that work or, or does not work, um, that would be Great, thank you. Madam Chair, members, David Jones, on behalf of Sacramento and Truckee, uh, we are opposed to the bill. I think we agree with much of the discussion already. We think the uh, uh, definition of enforceable obligation specifically codifies a uh, definition we think uh, codifies what Department of Finance is doing that's going to knock out things that we believe are enforceable obligations. So we'll submit those comments in writing and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sharon. Report with the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Um, the Corporation for Supportive Housing is a uh, nonprofit with offices throughout California with the mission of preventing and ending homelessness. We have, among the 12,000 units that Mr. Kilbridge mentioned, we have in our development pipeline uh, well over 800 units specifically designed for people who are chronically homeless, individuals and families, that would not be able to go forward if this trailer bill language passed. Um, and uh, those projects are leveraging hundreds of millions of dollars um, that in commitments from um, other local, state, um, private, and federal institutions. So we uh, would ask that you consider a different proposal that would allow those projects to go forward. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Julie Snyder representing Housing California. At this time, we would urge rejection of the budget trailer bill language. From our perspective, most of what's in it has very little to do with the budget, and as you indicated, Madam Chair should more appropriately go through the policy committee process. On the piece that does relate to the budget, we would urge rejection of the sweeping of the housing funds in 2012-13 for the reasons that Phil and others have outlined. Thank you. Thank you. 
Brian Augusto on behalf of Western Center on Law and Poverty echo many of the comments with, with respect to the reasons for rejection of the trailer bill language. We are going to work with our colleagues at the uh, Public Interest Law Project to provide more detailed critique of the trailer bill language for your staff and for leadership so that you can see many of the problems that we think still need to be worked out and ought to be uh, in a policy committee rather than in the budget. So for those reasons, uh, we would reject the uh, trailer bill language. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Maureen Higgins representing the California Housing Consortium. We also urge rejection of the trailer bill language and associate ourselves with the comments of the previous three speakers. Thank you. Hi, Carl Alpha Satellite Housing. Um, we're a nonprofit developer and management agent. Uh, we uh, also reject the uh, language of the trailer bill and support uh, the preservation of low mod funds for California families and seniors. Thank you. Bob Arlen Bush, Executive Director of the Sacramento Housing Alliance. We're an advocacy organization with over 100 members, many developers. We're opposed to the trailer bill and also opposed uh, on the uh, sweep of the, of the low and mod funds. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Jack Christie with Aging Services of California. Our members build and manage affordable senior housing, and we oppose the uh, trailer bill language, too. Thank you. Greg DeGier with the Oregon United Cerebral Palsy uh, Coalition of people with developmental disabilities and their families, friends, and service providers. Uh, people who have had the misfortune of being born with or quickly developing autism or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or some other developmental disability, once they become adults are, are generally poverty stricken. About half of homeless people have a, a disability of some sort. Uh, housing is a, is a, affordable housing is a critical need for, these, for our, the people we, re we represent and sweeping up the housing funds, obviously. We can only hurt that and we oppose the trailer bill language. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Astman. I'm with affordable housing developer Palm Communities and we oppose the sweep of housing funds. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Ali Nagraj with Midpen Housing Corporation. We oppose the sweep of low mod housing funds. We do a lot of our work in Silicon Valley, some of the most expensive real estate, as you know, in the country, and are working to try to have more working class families and seniors have a decent place to live. So we are really reliant on these low mod housing funds, have a lot of projects that are queued up that can get started really soon with, with additional low mod housing funds. So we, we oppose any sweep. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Levine with Affordable Housing Associates, and we also oppose the sweep of the low mod funds. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Roxanne Miller representing the Mayor, City Council, City of San Jose. We stipulate to the other earlier comments made. We'd also like to point out we will be providing in detail issues related to the enforceable obligations as well as uh, the subordination of the pass-through payments and would ask you to reject this proposal and we will work closely with you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mike Daly from EAH Housing. We uh, own and manage over 7,500 units of affordable housing for seniors and families and people with disabilities and um, based in San Rafael, but we're all over California. Uh, we also oppose the sweep of the low mod housing funds. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie McFadden on behalf of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors speaking specifically to the budget trailer bill language. Uh, thank you very much for keeping this item open. We would like to work with all of you to improve the process that get better transparency and, and improve the due process provisions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Holly Wonder Stiles. I'm with Sacramento Yolo Mutual Housing Association, and we also encourage you and request that you um, reject the proposal to sweep the low moderate um, housing funds. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Vicente Rosas. I'm with. Uh, I'm representing Sincere Construction Incorporated today. We oppose this bill. Uh, the uh, sweeping of these funds will eliminate the ability of people to provide uh, to get jobs. It will eliminate jobs, uh, bottom line. And uh, when you strip a, a, a person of, of the right to have a job, you strip them from dignity. I think uh, by creating new jobs, you'll give these people back their dignity and the ability to put food and uh, roof over, over their families. Um, so I, we, str we strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Greg Whitaker. For the last five years, I've worked with Pacific West Communities to bring a 49-unit low rental income housing development to South Lake Tahoe. This was uh, fully permitted and entitled and given low moderate income housing funds in 2009. However, without these low moderate income housing funds, if these get taken away, this project will be permanently killed. Uh, thank you. I urge you to oppose the sweeping of the low moderate housing fine. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lee Turner McKee. I'm Chief of Staff of the Community Housing Opportunities Corporation. We serve the very low, the low, and the moderate income families of Solano, Sacramento, Yolo, and Butte counties with 29 properties. And we violently oppose any of uh, the language in the trailer bill and also uh, any sweeping of the L&M funds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my only closing comment since the recommendation is to hold this open is that um, I think what you're hearing from both members of this committee and members of the public and, and uh, the people here representing cities and other groups is that we need to continue to work on this trailer bill language. And I think it's in both of our interests, the Department of Finance as well as the legislature's interest to, to sit down and have some serious conversations over the next week and try and get it right. Because if we don't get it right, one is I, I, I question whether or not we really get re receive the savings or the maximum amount we can. And two, we're going to end up uh, resulting in everyone incurring unnecessary legal fees. We're not going to avoid all the, all, the, um, all, all the conflict. I mean, there's still going to be some areas where we disagree. But I think we need to sit down and, and figure out how we can um, clarify the language in a way that's fair, in a way that follows the intent of the legislature when it passed AB 26, and in a way that provides greater clarity to all of us, because cities are under the same kind of financial stress that the state's under, and we all need that certainty, certainty to be able to, to plan our budgets and, and avoid the big financial surprises that uh, turns everything upside down for, for people and, and uh, has huge impacts on our communities. So I, I would encourage you to, to continue to uh, work with us and uh, figure out if there's not a better win-win solution for all of us. So and the administration's uh, committed to working with the legislature on this issue. We, we, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, the um, next item on the agenda is the 